we're going to the final block of today, final block of session and pitches. And actually, I wanted to start or end a bit like the way we started, with a challenger, a traditional organization. I think I referred to Gerrit Salm this morning as a dead man walking, or not. And then to grill the keynotes or grill the speakers. The subject we have for this session, InsureTech, could have been a conference on its own. Because, of course, we talk a lot about how banks are being disrupted. In this session, we're going to talk about how insurance companies are going to be disrupted. So we invited Allianz, a traditional insurance company, to defend itself. We have two challengers. But like this morning, we want to start with a passionate and energetic and dynamic speaker who can explain really well what's going to happen, who the new kids on the block are, what the potential disruptors are, and what's going to happen to the traditional insurance companies. So, Pascal, I would like to invite you to come to stage. There are two ironies that I've just uh, noticed while coming up the stage. Uh, and these ironies are uh, especially true if you're German. Apparently, it takes three Germans to handle one Frenchman. <coughs> these are three Germans. <laughs> um, and the second irony is uh, it's a Frenchman who is going to explain to three Germans uh, the why, the what, the when, the how of uh, how insurance is being disrupted. So for me, it's especially ironic. Thank you very much, everyone. <clears throat> um, rather than go immediately into specific use cases, I was thinking that it would be good to uh, answer some very simple questions to tee up the conversation and the, and the panel. And these simple, simple questions are around why, around what, around how, around uh, who, and around when. Right. Uh, we usually get into the what immediately and, and the who without forgetting uh, how to answer the why. And so first answer is, you know, why indeed uh, should the insurance industry be disrupted? Uh, fairly big question, fairly deceptively easy question, but the question that we have to ask ourselves nonetheless. <clears throat> and simply put, if you think that Banking, lending, asset management are big industries uh, where there's a lot of inefficiency. Then when thinking about the insurance at the industry, multiply that thinking by 800. Think about uh, the top line for the insurance industry around the globe, which is in the trillions of, uh, of dollars. Think about how, by definition and by nature, insurance companies have to be risk-averse uh, for their business models. That's how they survive, right, to look at risk. Uh, unfortunately for most insurance companies, that thinking has seeped through how they organize themselves, how they do business, <clears throat> which means that they haven't been very good at adopting over the years uh, technology. You go into the city of London and uh, the heart of one of the centers for the insurance at the world, and you see a lot of insurance people gathering uh, and, and taking with them a lot of paperwork. Uh, that's a cliche, but actually it's a, uh, it's a, true, it's a true one. <clears throat> so, this means that if you think again with the analogy of the banking world, that banks are behind, uh, especially if you're not a banker, uh, that holds true also for insurance companies, right? Technologies, uh, policy administration systems, the entire technology stack is antiquated. Uh, you may have uh, certain algorithms and pieces of software that are used for underwriting or that are used for claim management that are also not up to par. <clears throat> That's very important to think about. In other words, disruption hasn't come to the insurance world yet. Uh, probably has come to the banking world and we're into the third or fourth or fifth year where the insurance at the world has just begun to, at, at, uh, the, uh, to deploy itself. <clears throat> and again, as with uh, banking, uh, you have a perfect storm of new technologies that are coming online, um, and I'll, I'll refer to them later on, as well as consumer behaviors that are changing and enterprise behaviors and expectations that are that they're changing. So that definitely has an impact on how an interest company uh, organizes itself and, and takes, uh, takes on risk and, and, and shares risk. 
Um, and then finally, uh, to close on the uh, to close on the why, um, there hasn't been that much investment uh, on the venture side uh, with uh, innovative startups yet in the insurance world. If you again relate to how humongous the insurance industry is, uh, I think that's a quirk that will correct itself, and we're at the very beginning of major scaling of investments from traditional VCs as well as corporate VCs within the, at the insurance world. <clears throat> so that's a why. What? Uh, you know, you could take uh, this morning's keynote um, and replace every uh, word that referred to bank with a word that referred to insurance, and you would have exactly the same paradigm, right? Uh, throughout the enti entire value chain of the uh, insurance industry, from the point of distribution to the distribution channel to the uh, primary uh, uh, insurance carrier to the reinsurance uh, carrier across workflows and processes, and the main ones are obviously um, acquiring the client and then underwriting the, the risk and then doing claims management. And then obviously, and, and finally, not that it's a pillar that is a, a solely for the insurance industry, but asset management, all of these, right, are up for grabs. Uh, brick and mortar uh, is going to be challenged. Agents, brokers, master brokers, the equivalent of a master broker in, uh, in Europe, are going to be challenged with digital uh, formats. The way that you underwrite is going to be done in a much more precise manner, <clears throat> not in the way that it used to be. And the, the way that you uh, do claims management also is going to uh, uh, change that, uh, drastically. In other words, everything is up for grabs from a D2C and from a B2B point of view. So that's the what. Um, the how is a little trickier, um, and it involves the technologies that I mentioned uh, earlier, right? Uh, everyone is familiar with the acronym WMD, sadly, Weapons of Mass Destruction. Uh, I believe that there is a set of technologies that are equivalent to WMDs. Um, apply to the financial services industry in general and apply to insurance in particular. Uh, and these are uh, in no particular order of either preference or importance, um, artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, or consensus ledgers, um, internet of things, quantum computing at a, at a, at a later stage, uh, uh, obviously, that all are going to be applied to various workflows and, and processes. That's the how. And there are two camps uh, for these uh, technologies. They're going to be the ones that are weapons of mass precision, i.e. artificial intelligence, uh, IoT, to get to much more granular understanding of risk and of uh, data, and then weapons of mass trust creation, like uh, blockchain technology for the insurance world. <clears throat> so we're, we've closed the, uh, uh, the how. So we're left with two questions, um, the when and the whom. Uh, the when, I think it's already started with certain technologies like uh, telematics and robotics. Insurance companies are ahead of the curve and have started to adapt the way that they, uh, uh, for example, risk price uh, auto insurance through usage base and, and the use of telematics. Um, excuse me. <coughs> but there's much more uh, uh, to go, and I think that over the next 10, 15 years, we'll have an unfolding of that, uh, of that disruption. And finally, the more important and the uh, most important question and the funniest one, uh, at least uh, when you talk to a, a large entrance at the company, is the who. Um, and I think the who is uh, not entirely settled. Um, I don't necessarily think startups will completely destroy uh, insurance companies, nor do I necessarily believe that insurance companies, whether they're reinsurance companies or insurance companies' primary carriers, will come out unscathed uh, out, of this, uh, uh, out of this transformation. I think that there may be some collaboration, like in the banking world, and this morning we had uh, a flavor of collaboration and platform strategies and so on and so forth. Um, but I also think that there's another path that very few people within any conference that focuses on fintech uh, talks about seriously, which is both fintech startups, in this case, insurtech startups, uh, and incumbents may both lose. And they may both, both lose to entrants that do not come from the financial services in industry and the insurance industry. Think about uh, large technology giants 
that are encroaching first in payments uh, and then in other products and services in the insurance, uh, in the uh, financial services industry, including uh, insurance. And these are not only coming from the U.S. or from Europe, but they're also coming from uh, from Asia, notably at, uh, China. And you could very well have a strategic path going forward where both uh, new startups as well as large insurance companies uh, lose ground. So uh, I'll conclude because uh, uh, I also want to hear, and you also want to hear about the, the other panelists, and saying that, uh, in my view, insurance as we know it up to now is dead. Um, maybe a few people uh, recognize, it, recognize this. Uh, a lot more do not know yet. That doesn't mean that the business of insuring is dead. That means that insurance companies will have to adapt and change completely, else someone else will do it for them and will eat their lunch. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, thank you. I- One more question. This morning, David said banks have six to 12 months to adapt, adapt or die. It sounds insurance companies, if I hear you speaking, have more time. I, I think it's you know the iceberg effect, right? Uh, when you see it, it's too late. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't quantify six to 12 months because. Uh, you know, who knows? I might be 50% right 100% of the time <clears throat> at, uh, on that. So I would say there is a period of, let's say, five years going forward uh-huh. where things will be decided. There are some decisions that need to be made within the next two, three m- months, some in the next year, some in the next two years. But within a five-year period, uh, people that either do not make the right decisions or do not make decisions will find themselves in very troublesome strategic uh, positions. That's how I would, you know... Uh, play out the timing. A little longer than six, 12 months. However, don't daily dally. Thank you very much, Pascal. Well, this, of course, asks for a reaction from an insurance company. So we are very proud that Mark from Alliance came to Amsterdam. Please give him a hand. Thank Mark, you. I heard Pascal say, insurance, that's dangerous. Luckily, you're an insurer. Insurance as we know it is dead. Do you agree with that? Um, Yeah, of course not. Uh, Otherwise, uh, (laughs) there would be a difficult discussion and it would be quite boring. Um, I think uh, um, the one who will survive will be the one who will be able to adapt uh, to what's going on. And not so much um, uh, just uh, uh, because insurance is dead. The way we think about uh, disruption um, or what we do is, uh, I would say, reflecting to your how, uh, even a little bit more broader. Uh, when we think about uh, what are the trends and disruptions that will have impact to, to our business model, uh, we think about uh, topics like cybersecurity, uh, digital health, um, certainly connected car, which you mentioned, certainly the connected home, Internet of Things as, as a topic, but also the data, big data and analytics field is quite important. Of course, uh, many companies we see are innovating in the uh, uh, insurance tech world, although the number is still small. I think we already started to look quite broad because we know that uh, we need to find an answer to who is insuring the self-driving car in the future and what technologies will be uh, available to price risk uh, for the drivers. I mean, we have already today uh, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, uh, telematic solutions which uh, uh, enable you with your smartphone to track your driving behavior, and then we can start, start thinking about pricing these risks. Um, but if uh, the driver is not driving himself anymore, there will be total different questions, of course. So I think technology uh, or digitalization for, for us, for Allianz, uh, is more an opportunity um, rather than a threat uh, because we uh, in the past were always challenged with we have low interactions with our, cu- our customers. Uh, in the beginning, we sold the contract and then there was a lot of uh, a long time uh, where nothing happens until the claim was there. And then the experience uh, is always starting with a negative experience. The customer is in a difficult situation, and then we step in and and fulfill our promise. Uh, I think technology digitalization offers us much more ways to interact with customers, much more services we can provide uh, while we're having the contact with the customers. So that's why I think uh, we have a very strong position to start with um, 
uh, going to the journey of uh, disruption or digitalization of, of our industry. But I can imagine that if uh, <clears throat> your organization is not suited to do so, it can be very dangerous to have more contact with your customer. I gave you this example. I was speaking to one of the banks, Tun and I, in preparation of this summit. We asked them, what will you be your focus in the upcoming year? And they said, my customers. And so you think that's a brilliant answer. And they said, I will specify it. We want to make our cust- we want to have a discussion with our customers how they can become more profitable for us or go to another bank. Okay. I can imagine having those kind of people talk to your customers can be quite dangerous. Do you need a big change to realize that? And can you tell us how hard that is and how you are making that transition? No, you're absolutely right. In the beginning, I would say when we when we still were distributing our products through our tight agents or uh, face-to-face uh, uh, distribution channels, there was a strong connection between the customer and and us as a brand. But then, when it comes to transaction, how to execute kind of on claims on. Uh, uh, on the way to interact with the customer digitally, that is not our strength, definitely not. It was the relationship we had with the customer through the personal interaction. It was about the trust we have with the customer, the financial strengths that we are there when, when money has to be paid. All these things were making customers stuck, but not the great <coughs> digital interaction. There's a lot we need to learn. And I think that's also a very interesting journey then to work with young companies because that's what, how they start. I mean, we start or we still work in some areas with papers. The, when you found a company now, everything is digital from day one. Um, and there's a lot for us to learn uh, this journey. We will certainly do something ourselves. Uh, so what one initiative we have started is creating a what we call digital factory, which tries to identify the core processes in the insurance world and makes them so digital that we have a standard high quality in the group that every country or company can use these processes as the benchmark for the way Allianz wants to interact with the customer. But that's, of course, a big mission for an organization that has more than 140,000 people in more than 80 countries of the world to have these type of standardizations. I don't think we will get there quite quickly, uh, but I think if we don't do it, uh, we will lose out on the digital end, definitely. And, of course, I can imagine it's very hard to transition such a big organization, but aren't you afraid you're going to be too late or it's going to be too little too late? I think speed is certainly not, nothing that uh, large organizations are known for. Uh, and uh, what, I mean, in, in the young company world, six months can, me, can, can mean the life of the company. For us, this is uh, just between potentially two or three very important meetings to get the right people agree to this is what we want to, go, want to do. So I, I, I definitely agree that uh, in the past we were too slow. We try to use certainly more kind of modern ways to work in an agile mode uh, in the future, but that's a, that's a big challenge for us uh, to be faster. I don't think uh, that uh, we will uh, be under risk if we don't change in the next year, but I think the next two to five years are really critical for us to be able to manage that journey. But why are you going to succeed in two years or in five years, which you cannot do the next year? No, I think, well, I mean, uh, changing a large organization is not happening in one year. I think that's, that's for sure. But, so that's why I think we need to have a little longer time. But for individual countries or companies, that is, that is too long. They need to change faster. I, I totally agree. But uh, looking at this from a large organization, I would say that's uh, an appropriate time horizon. And what is the keys to changing those countries? I think the key is to get people enrolled in the change. Yeah? I mean, the, the people who have built this company will continue uh, to work, certainly, with all their skills that they have acquired uh, and that delivered uh, uh, the large returns we produce. Um, so we need to enroll them, and we are doing this by creating um, uh, projects, teams, work modes where there's a very strong collaboration mode um, on trying to working hard on these uh, digital agendas. Are these the same existing people that have been working at you 
at Allianz for years, or are these new people? I think, well, we, we still believe we have a great uh, skill set of people um, that are within the organization, but we need the talents that are uh, living and breathing digital, definitely. So we will bring and do this today, uh, certainly uh, quite intensively, uh, digital talent, people who are um, uh, working in a different work mode um, to help us uh, uh, master that journey. Final question before I bring Dennis and Paul into the discussion. We heard Pascal talk about the startups, but we also heard him talk about those big technological companies. Who do you fear the most? I think it's a. I think that's a very interesting observation because when you when you ask people, um, uh, would they trust Amazon uh, or uh, uh, Apple in terms of their uh, financial uh, transactions, they would say yes. And I think that's a big threat for everybody who is uh, in financial services, be it insurance or banking, because all of a sudden new strong players have the same trust in financial matters as you have, where we were claiming we are the trusted financial institution. Uh, I think um, when they start uh, uh, going seriously into that business, that can be uh, uh, a strong disruption. We have seen also the Googles of the world trying to do that uh, in, in a couple of European markets. Then they step back because it doesn't uh, uh, bring their um, um, uh, doesn't deliver on their expectations. So I think we see them testing this, but uh, we have not yet seen somebody really making big moves. Thank you very much, Mark. Please be seated. I would also want to ask Dennis Just and Paul Morgenthaler to join us. Please be seated here, Paul. Mark. Mark. Please oh, be part okay. of the discussion. Sorry. Of course. What I want to do now Put is confront <laughs> on the, hot seat. the <laughs> old world with the new world uh, <clears throat> and see how worried the new kids on the block are by your answers about the change of Allianz, Mark, or whether they are very happy with your responses, which would not be very good for you, I think. <laughs> but maybe first, Dennis, you're from KNIP. Can you explain us a little bit what KNIP is and what KNIP does and what KNIP is all about? I mean, KNIP steps in as, I mean, in specifically in the arguments that, that Mark described around customer experience. Um, so we are a digital insurance broker. Um, we come, let's say, customer first. So we start off aggregating all the data from the customer, um, having algorithms around um, checking if they have there's the best policies, best prices, if everything goes together. And then there's a managing, let's say, ongoing engagement and ongoing managing included in that, meaning you can make claims out of, out of the application. It's essentially a broker in the pocket. Paul, can you describe what Commerce Ventures does? Yeah, Commerce Ventures is the venture capital fund of Commerce Bank. Uh, so some of you may wonder why is a bank VC um, active in InsureTech? And we see many parallels between the banking and insurance industry, and uh, Pascal already outlined that. And um, also, for us, it's quite natural um, because we have the relationships with, with all the major carriers. So um, when startups um, work with us, uh, I think we can really help. Um, so as a venture investor, um, what we're naturally less concerned with is um, how the incumbents will master their digital transformation, but we tend to think more about this from an opportunity point of view. What are the opportunities out there for startups? And um, basically, there, there are two plays, and um, you can decide either if you want to go into distribution, and um, Dennis is doing that with KNIP. We also have an investment in the insurance distribution space, or you can decide to go all in and to be a carrier from day one. And um, <clears throat> actually, um, like half a year ago, we found this second option to be a carrier. We, we found this extremely visionary, to put it like that. Um, however, recently we're getting on a weekly basis pitches of new carriers to be set up, alternative carriers that will aggressively leverage technology to improve the customer experience through the whole chain. Yeah? And then you get pitches of, of kids who, are, who want like a double-digit million euro seed financing round, and in some cases they don't have trouble raising it. Yeah? Um, so Why don't they have trouble raising it? Some of them don't have trouble raising it. I've seen these cases. 
Uh, and, and then I would like to ask Mark, what do you think about that? Do you think that there stand a chance or um, this is a losing proposition? I mean, we are thinking about these, these issues in a similar way because uh, uh, when, when we think about totally new approaches to customers and markets, uh, the question for us is, should we build this from within the core and try to innovate around the core with all the challenges a large organization has changing it, or should we set up a separate unit, separate innovation environment, and let this unit do this? Yeah? So I think the idea of doing that, that is the same idea we would also have. It would be interesting if somebody um, who is doing this uh, can do this outside of a large organization that has the skills how to set up and operate a carrier. Because it's, I think, not just technology that enables you to run this successfully. You need to have really deep insurance know-how in order to be able to set up um, a carrier. And besides the few we, uh, we see uh, in, uh, in Germany, Europe, they are not, the, the, the insurance industry is not that entrepreneurial. You don't see so many people launching new companies that really have insurance background, which is what we needed, I guess, for that purpose. Yeah, and But I you're would... investing in these type of companies, Paul, so you do believe that's possible. I would, I would totally agree with if you enter insurance, you should really know what you're doing. Yeah, it's a very special in industry with its own idiosyncrasies. Yeah, so I would definitely support teams um, that have experience and um, that know how it works. Yeah, um, so uh, what the advice that I uh, give to founders in the insurtech space is always learn by selling. Yeah, which translates into start in the distribution space, build up a proposition there, get your customers, get their data. And then at a later point, uh, leverage that and maybe move more, move more along the value chain and become a carrier yourself. But don't start from day one with that proposition. I think it, it's not the most capital efficient way. Yeah. I think it's essentially what happens in a way. So what you see is that, I mean, all the, let's say, the many, money that is allocated in the insurtech space is allocated in brokers, usually. And brokers that maybe tend to be a bit more on the side of comparison portals or might go a bit in an underwriting perspective. Um, cutting off Lemonade and, and these players from the U.S. Um, and the reason, I mean, as well, why we started in that space is to learn about the behavior of the customer and learn about the expectations because what you see in the insurance space, I mean, on the one hand, generation X, Y, Z, they, they don't care about insurances anymore. Um, and let's say it, having a policy is not a value proposition. So the value proposition is being safe in situations where things go wrong, let's say it like this. Um, but this is what you have to learn. So what's the experience that the customer expects? What are the expectations? How you can match them? Is it a chat? Is it a phone call? Is it nothing? All of that going to AI um, and having a, a robot on the back end that just reacts to, I broke my car, please pay me 1,000 bucks. Here's a photo, and he does it. Um, but the next step will definitely go into one of these directions. And I think what we see now, and we discussed it as well, is the, the reinsurance carriers now move more into the game um, because they have the knowledge um, and they can, can play, let's say, a big ball game um, in disrupting the whole value chain because they are the ones that take the big risk, um, that know how to underwrite. They haven't had customer contact yet, um, but essentially... In the end, maybe they don't need to have knowledge about that because from the other side, the startups are coming and kind of crushing the, the insurance carriers, the premier insurance carriers. So it's a bit more of the kind of view on the, on the market that we see. Dennis, uh, when will we start seeing this? We hear all about disruptions at banks. We see it. But in insurance, we hear it's coming, but we don't yet really see it. Will it be in the next year, the next two years? Will we have to wait for five more years? So, so the rhetoric right now about the disruption in insurance reminds me a lot about the rhetoric that we had in banking, say, three years ago, um, where some startups really had a very aggressive message, you know, and we are going to kill the banks. Yeah? And um, we're seeing that now in insurance tech. But if you look at the realities, actually most of the insure tech startups want to sell to insurers, yeah? so they're a B2B place. And actually, we, we did an analysis. Um, we, we screened um, roughly 500 um, insurtech startups worldwide, 
and we see that the clear majority, around more than 60% of them, are actually B2B plays selling to insurers. Yeah? So then the question for them that, that becomes really critical is, how do I effectively cooperate with the insurers? But also, of course, for you as an insurer, if you want to leverage them, what would be a good cooperation mode? And I think both sides really have to go through a learning curve there. And, and that's why I think um, what I said earlier is important. If you have startup founders who already know a little bit about the industry, I think that just shortens the time dramatically to get to the point to cooperation. I don't know how you will see that. Maybe a nice point to end between you and Mark. What does Mark need to change to make it easier for these new disruptors, these new insured tech companies, to collaborate with him? So I think in, in, in one sentence, um, set up a specific um, startup sourcing process. Some banks are already doing that, that they're cutting down the time um, of engagement with startups yeah, that you can have within six months, you can have an accelerated purchasing process. And um, I think setting up something like that, maybe it would also work in the insurance industry. Is this something you're doing, Mark? And what would you ask from the insured tech, the new kids on the block to do so they can collaborate with you? No, I mean, I, I, I agree. I think that's a good idea <clears throat> because uh, once you are in the purchasing process of the IT department with your solution, then uh, you are lined up with all the other providers and it is a difficult process to get through. Um, for good reasons uh, sometimes. <clears throat> um, so having a, a, a more safe environment to test and pilot these things which are more uh, of more innovative nature might be, might be a good place. Um, so what we would expect from, from, the, from the startups, <clears throat> I think sometimes patience is important um, to be able to sell to large organizations. Um, certainly, the opportunity is always very big if you uh, have somebody like uh, uh, the big guys as a customer that helps you in your sales process to the rest of the community. Um, but um, I think patience is important. Certainly, all the features on data security, which you are very sensitive to, um, uh, need to be met. And we, in many cases, see that uh, the young companies are still in the process of creating that maturity. Um, but I think uh, all in all, both sides will learn over time how to how to best work to, uh, together. Because I believe that that is really a cooperation mode we will we will see in the future, rather than a this is uh, just the challenger and this is the incumbent and they try their own ways. Uh, I think it will be much more collaboration in that field. You say I need to have more patience, but the more money you have, the more patience you have. And if you're a new company, you don't have a lot of money. Yeah. So you don't have a lot of patience. They can wait and wait till you want to collaborate, and then they're broke. How are we going to deal with that? Yeah, so the way we try to solve that is that we also do investments. So we, we make investments in young companies, which we find promising. Um, and uh, sometimes we, at day one of the investment, have already a partnership agreement in place where we know exactly how to collaborate and which market we want to start the initiatives when. Uh, but sometimes we also have uh, uh, said, okay, we need to give this uh, technology time to prosper and raise and, and get mature. We start very slowly to uh, get in touch with the uh, startup and bring our organization towards, uh, to the company um, to not kind of over-engineer uh, the relationship and to give both sides the, the time uh, to create something uh, big in the future. So I think um, that's one way to do it. Uh, but uh, um, certainly when both sides see that there's an interesting partnership uh, uh, ahead, then uh, both sides uh, will normally make things happen. And that's also true for large organizations. Thank you. Pascal, can you join us for a final conclusion? Pascal, you opened this session. You heard the discussion. Is InsureTech the next big thing coming? Uh, most definitely. Um, you know, there's like a natural steady state of venture capital investments once a industry opens itself to uh, uh, some type of disruption. You know, there has to be some type of algorithm to figure out if it's two billions, four billion, three billion, whatever per year. But that's going to happen. And then you equate that to the top line that, uh, um, you know, insurance uh, companies in general over the world uh, uh, command. Uh, that will have to be impacted uh, by technology, by the application of technology. The, you know, one of the definitions of uh, the technology is 
you do more with less. Mm -hmm. Right? So take one very specific example, um, what is called the flow in the insurance business, uh, which is basically auto and uh, uh, home uh, uh, insurance, right? It's probably the most commoditized as opposed to either cat risk, reinsurance, uh, very large complex, complex risks. Just one simple data point, right? For one euro of premium, 40 cents is burned to admin and probably reserve to uh, uh, profit. That's only 60 cents for claims. I do not think, and I would challenge anyone here on this panel, I do not think that that's sustainable and that will change. So the application of technology to either uh, better customer acquisition, better uh, underwriting, better claims management will reduce that ratio. That will mean lower uh, top growth. That will mean probably rationalization of how insurance companies and the distribution uh, uh, channel uh, uh, works. But it will happen. It will happen. Probably less so uh, and uh, over a longer period of time for more complex risk. But for anything that is commoditized, you know, you bet your bottom euro or dollar uh, uh, on that. Well, thank you very much. We'll be paying attention to it. Give them a, a, a great hand, I should please. <laughs>